If you have low thyroid function or hypothyroidism, you likely also have a mineral deficiency. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through why minerals are so important for your thyroid function and what key minerals to focus on and how they move the thyroid. And one of the key things I see with clients is coming in with so many nutrient deficiencies, particularly within minerals. Once we're able to restore minerals and also do that alongside of supportive other processes like helping the gut digest and absorb these minerals better for one example, then we can actually help start to robustly improve our thyroid's own function and actually slowly decrease the need for thyroid hormone replacement or potentially even get them off thyroid hormone replacement entirely. Let's talk about why minerals matter and which ones to focus on. Minerals act as primarily cofactors for enzymatic activity in the body. What that means is that in order for things within our cells to function as they should, we need minerals to be able to run the show. Think of them as like the spark plugs in the car, making sure that everything runs as it should. That's what minerals do. Minerals also are responsible for actually making thyroid hormones and helping convert those thyroid hormones over to the active usable form in the body. Take T4 and T3, for example. Those are the actual active thyroid hormones that we're looking at testing when we're talking about someone having low thyroid function. Although TSH is the common value that is tested in conventional medicine, it doesn't actually tell us how many hormones the thyroid is making because it's not actually a thyroid hormone. It's actually a hormone that's made from a place in our brain called the pituitary gland, and TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So all it does is actually stimulate down to the thyroid to make T4, and then that T4 has to convert over to the active form of thyroid hormone called T3. And 90% of this process actually doesn't happen in the thyroid. About 70% happens in the liver, and about 10 to 20% happens in the gut, with about 10% happening in the thyroid. So a very small and insignificant amount of this actually is happening in the thyroid gland. Most of this thyroid hormone conversion over to that active usable form is happening peripherally in other sites of the body, and minerals are incredibly important to this process. The number four in T4 actually stands for how many iodine molecules are attached to tyrosine, which is an amino acid. So T4 stands for four iodine molecules, and T3 stands for three iodine molecules. Iodine is a mineral that actually functions as an oxidant, which means that it can promote oxidative stress if in excess. However, we know from the literature that both iodine deficiency as well as too much iodine can both cause hypothyroidism. So we always want to be really cautious with when and how we integrate iodine into the picture because when we add more iodine into the mix, it's going to make the process of thyroid hormone activity happen quicker, which is a good thing, but we want to make sure that we have all the free radical support in place so that as part of this process, we're not seeing more oxidative stress and inflammation occur. So iodine is an incredible mineral to this process. Iodine is particularly found in sea vegetables and seafood. You get some of it as well in dairy products, a little bit of it in the eggs, but primarily the richest sources are things like kelp and seaweed and seafoods. Other cultures, like such as in Asia, eat an incredibly large amount of iodine, much higher than the U.S. recommended daily allowance of iodine, and it makes you wonder how those cultures actually have much lower rates of obesity as well as osteoporosis compared to the U.S., and both obesity and osteoporosis are two diseases that are driven from thyroid dysfunction. Now, outside of just those seafood and sea vegetable sources, you can also supplement with iodine. You want to make sure that if you are going to supplement with iodine, that it's in the potassium iodide form primarily. My favorite for this is a solution called Lugol's. They make different percentage solutions of it, but it's been one of the most research-backed ways of replenishing iodine levels. You can test for iodine both within the serum and the blood, as well as you can do a 24-hour urinary iodine exchange excretion where you consume iodine and then you're testing how much gets excreted over the period of 24 hours. However, all iodine testing has its limitations. And so it really is best to go based off of overall thyroid function and symptoms, and then potentially also pairing that with other markers, but like looking at some of your other mineral values, such as iron, selenium, and inflammation that we're going to talk about in today's video. So if you're starting anywhere, iron is going to be one of the most critical, but like I mentioned, you don't always want to start with replenishing iodine first. 
Next up is selenium. Selenium is one of the most important minerals outside of iodine for the thyroid. And selenium is actually what helps control this oxidative stress process as part of the process of our body making thyroid hormones. So we need selenium to keep everything regulated so that things don't get out of control and drive too much oxidative stress and inflammation. Selenium also is very important for making glutathione. And glutathione is our body's master antioxidant that also helps regulate this process. Selenium is primarily found in Brazil nuts, so the most potent source on the planet. And you really only need a couple per day to be able to get in a couple hundred micrograms of selenium, which is the daily recommended amount. However, as I mentioned before, sometimes these daily recommended amounts aren't quite enough, especially for people that have thyroid dysfunction. So a lot of times we may need supplementation of selenium as well. We do need to be cautious to not overdo it with selenium as too much selenium can actually cause issues with blood sugar, which a lot of individuals with low thyroid function experience. I have another YouTube video where you can learn more about how the thyroid affects blood sugar and how it can affect both CGM and A1C values. Outside of Brazil nuts, you are going to get some small amounts of selenium through some meat sources as well. So it's always a good idea to make sure that we have enough protein in place to be able to help ensure we're meeting our daily selenium needs. Selenium, I would say, is the number two most important mineral for the thyroid. Next up is zinc. Zinc is an incredibly important antioxidant. It is a mineral as well, and it's very important for helping convert T4 over to that active form T3. So in some individuals, when we look at the thyroid panel, we see that there's maybe pretty good levels of T4, but there's some conversion issues that are happening, and it might make sense to supplement with zinc. Zinc is primarily found in some nuts and seeds, as well as shellfish. You might have heard of oysters before being a really great source of zinc, and that's true. They are one of the best sources of zinc that's out there. However, we want to make sure that when we choose to supplement with zinc, that we're really cautious about the ratio with copper because too much zinc will actually deplete our body's copper levels. And copper is another really important mineral, really involved in iron recycling and helping make sure that our iron levels stay adequate and that our body's utilizing iron properly. We're going to talk about iron here in a second because that's another really important mineral for the thyroid. So you can look at utilizing zinc supplementation for short periods of time, or you can look at utilizing something like a complex that provides you with both zinc and small amounts of copper simultaneously. I love our mineral complex, which is called Mineral Magic. I formulated it specifically to provide the right ratio of copper and zinc alongside some of these other minerals and small amounts like selenium, iodine, molybdenum, and such. And you can learn more about that over at functionalfeeling.com backslash mineral dash magic. Next up is iron. Iron deficiency is the most common nutrient deficiency worldwide. It's especially common in women of reproductive age because you lose iron every menstrual cycle. Iron is really important for oxygen transport and delivery throughout the body, and it's been shown that iron deficiency can directly cause hypothyroidism. I would say that's one of the most common deficiencies that we see across the board in individuals that have thyroid disorders is also iron deficiency, and iron is really dependent off of adequate stomach acid, which is another common hurdle we see with low thyroid function is inadequate stomach acid or hypochloridia. So we need to make sure that we have adequate iron and we're absorbing that iron well to be able to help ensure that we have enough in the system to support thyroid hormone production and also support transport of hormones and even help with reproductive hormone levels too that fund inflammation in the reproductive system. Iron is similar to iodine and then it also is pro-oxidative, which means that it can drive oxidative stress. So similarly, we want to make sure that before we add iron into the mix, that we have enough anti-inflammatory and oxidative stress control in place so that it doesn't actually cause more oxidative stress and inflammation within the thyroid gland. Iron is also critical for thyroid peroxidase enzyme activity. Thyroid peroxidase or TPO is that TPO enzyme that the immune system attacks in the situation of um, elevated anti-TPO antibodies. That's one of the classical hallmark signs of Hashimoto's is high levels of anti-TPO. But TPO specifically is the enzyme that helps our body to be able to make thyroid hormones. And we need iron to be able to make adequate amounts of TPO. We can check our iron levels through doing a CBC, looking at things like hemoglobin hematocrit, as well as looking alongside things like iron Iron storage proteins such as ferritin, iron, total serum iron levels, TIBC, and iron saturation. That really gives us the full picture of 
iron levels, iron storage, what's in the bloodstream, and how iron is getting utilized and circulated throughout the body. And sometimes it can be helpful to see iron alongside other nutrients like copper and vitamin A because those are what really help direct iron and kind of traffic control it and tell it what to do in the body. A lot of times we see that those are also low in individuals that have iron deficiency because of the key situation that these three nutrients all play with one another. You can primarily get iron through iron-rich meat products. Any type of animal protein is going to be really rich in iron, especially your darker, more red meat versions. Those are heme iron, which is much better absorbed than non-heme iron. Non-heme iron are what is what you get in plant iron foods. Those would be things like spinach as well as some of your beans and such. However, we have to be careful with those because a lot of those plant sources of iron, they're poorly absorbed and they also have a lot of protein protective compounds with them like oxalates and phytates that actually bind up the amount of iron that actually can get absorbed from eating those foods. So most of the time people that struggle with iron deficiency are typically those that aren't eating any type of animal proteins where they're getting that really easily absorbable form of iron through those heme iron sources. If you are on a vegan or vegetarian diet and it's out of the picture for you, then some things you can look at to help increase absorption would be to cook spinach before eating it. That'll help break down some of the oxalates. You can also, with things like beans, you can pressure cook them or soak them before cooking or even buy them already pressure cooked and soaked. And that'll actually help destroy some of those phytates so that more of the iron becomes bioavailable. You can also pair those iron rich sources with an acidic source like vitamin C, and that'll help actually absorb that iron better as well. So think of something like citrus fruits, lemon, limes, oranges, or even tomatoes can be a great thing to have alongside of those non-heme iron sources to help enhance that absorption. And then making sure that we have a really acidic stomach when we go to eat those meals, whether it's non-heme or a heme source, so animal or plant, making sure that we have a lot of acid in the stomach. I like to do a little bit of apple cider vinegar or lemon before those meals and really make sure that we're not diluting that with lots of water during the meal or lots of calcium or tan. Tannins. Calcium is what you're going to find in dairy-rich products, and then tannins are what you would find in teas and chocolates and coffee. So when we're having those more iron-rich foods, trying to make sure that we have them alongside acid and that we're limiting dairy, tea, coffee, and chocolates at the same meal. I know that's a lot of specifics, but that will really help you with enhancing the iron absorption. And then further, if we really see that there is true iron deficiency, that's where we can look at utilizing supplementation to be able to help with things. Another really important mineral here is magnesium. You might have heard before that magnesium is involved in over 300 enzymatic reactions in the body. It's very important for mitochondrial function. And anyone that has a low thyroid function has diminished mitochondrial function because our thyroid hormones actually help regulate the function of our mitochondria. So we want to make sure that we definitely have enough magnesium on board. It's very critical for helping support energy production and ATP, as well as converting that T4 over to its active form, free T3. So we can get magnesium through things like dark leafy greens, as well as chocolates and some seeds like pumpkin seeds. You can also absorb magnesium somewhat topically. So you could do something like an Epsom salt bath or a magnesium soak, magnesium flakes, or even a magnesium spray on your feet to be able to absorb some of that through the skin as well. If you've ingested too much magnesium, you're probably going to know because you'll have a more loose or more mushy like stool. Um, that's just going to mean that there's more magnesium that's probably in the gut than what your body was able to utilize. So not everyone deals with the magnesium fit deficiency that has low thyroid function, but it can be a really great option to rule out either through getting a magnesium RBC red blood cell test done where we're testing how much is within the cell for utilization and or trying out some of these strategies like supplementing with some magnesium and adding in some of the magnesium Epsom salt soaks or magnesium sprays to see how your body responds to them. The best next steps to take on your mineral balancing journey is to do testing that helps us understand your specific mineral deficiencies. We offer two different ways of testing mineral levels. The first one is through what's called a hair tissue mineral analysis or HTMA. This is actually looking within the hair follicle to test mineral levels. This is a test that we offer in our group program, Inflammation Harmony, and you can learn more about the program and when we might have the next one starting over at functionalfeeling.com backslash inflammation dash harmony. 
or we also offer a serum and white blood cell or red blood cell micronutrient testing panel within our one-on-one program. This is a more advanced panel that doesn't just test mineral levels, but also tests amino acids, as well as all of your vitamins to give us a 365 degree view of all vitamin and mineral deficiencies that could be at play. We often will couple this with additional testing that helps us understand the root causes of your low thyroid function, such as a viral infections panel, or maybe even looking at other hormonal markers or within the immune system and inflammation markers to understand why there's low thyroid function or a condition like hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's at play. You can learn more about our one-on-one program where we offer this test over at functionalfeeling.com backslash coaching dash page. If you love this video and you want to learn more about topics just like this, hit the bell so you can subscribe to my channel to be the first to know when I release a new video.